Welcome to the seventh session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS, this virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over June to December 2020 with plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and the sustainable development goals in the Asia Pacific region context. Today's session is in the lead up to the International Day for Older Persons, which as we all know is on October 1st. And this session focuses on population aging and sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia and the Pacific. I'm also very happy to share with you that Aging Nepal, an NGO working for the rights and welfare of the elderly, was recently awarded the UNESCO King Sejong Literacy Prize for 2020 for its program, Basic Literacy for Older Adults. And we are indeed proud that the founding chairperson of Aging Nepal, Mr. Krishnamurari Gautam, who received this award on 8th September which was the World Literacy Day, is one of our plenary speakers for today. Our heartiest congratulations to Krishnaji and to Aging Nepal. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Ms. Sono Aibe. Sono is an independent consultant based in the US, working with philanthropic and nonprofit organizations. During 2009-2019, she worked at Pathfinder International to expand sexual and reproductive health programs in the Asia region, including in China, Myanmar, and Vietnam. She's a Japanese national and has a master's degree from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Over to you, Sono. Thank you so much, Shoba, for your very kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to all of you joining today the seventh session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. I'm delighted to be the chair of today's session to learn from experts about this very important subject of population aging and sexual reproductive health and rights in the Asia Pacific region. I'm so glad that many of you are able to join us live and I'm sure many more will watch the recording as I have done for all of the other virtual sessions organized so far. I want to really thank the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia for inviting me to this session. And as a member of the Conference International Steering Committee, I would like to acknowledge all of the really hard work to organize this conference over the past two years. So as Shoba said, October 1st is the International Day of Older Persons. And getting old is the fact of life. We're all aging day by day. And we have to own that fact as living beings. There are a lot of negative images of elderly people, and we all fear losing our youthfulness. Ageism is discrimination that's based on assumptions about what happens to us when we all age. In the sexual reproductive health and rights world, for example, there's a common misperception that older people are not sexually active. So there's an assumption that they don't need sexual health services or counseling. And in low income countries where healthcare resources are already very stretched, women who are not reached through reproductive and maternal health programs may be missing age appropriate preventive health education or regular checkups. And needless deaths from preventable reproductive cancers could occur and people are often left to deal with sometimes debilitating symptoms and also psychological impact brought about by hormonal changes all on their own. So our commitment to sexual and reproductive health and rights means that we have to work to meet the sexual reproductive health needs of all people throughout their life cycle. That was what we pledged at the groundbreaking 1994 International Conference on Population and Development. Yet 26 years later, we are still barely keeping up meeting the needs of an increasing number of married women in reproductive ages 15 to 49. 
to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030, there is a target of universal access to sexual and reproductive health services under goal three, target 3.7. Sexuality of older people is almost a taboo subject. Most of the discussions focus on sexual dysfunction and rarely are sexual matters discussed even in the context of, of uh, healthcare, regular healthcare and among health professionals. And in the age of COVID, elderly people are considered vulnerable and therefore kept even more isolated from social interactions. And with COVID and the global economic downturn, a lot of older people are losing their jobs, which means leading, which means loss of health insurance coverage in the case of where I live in the US. And due to limited work opportunities for older people, coupled with an absence of social protection me measures, there's a real danger that timely and high quality healthcare will become inaccessible for the economically disadvantaged elderly population. I'm really far from being an expert in this topic of aging, so I'm particularly excited to chair the session today as we will learn from a very distinguished panel of speakers about the health, rights, and welfare of older people in the Asia Pacific, and in particular, the status of their sexual reproductive health and rights. And uh, as, Sai, uh, as Shoba said, we have uh, three plenary speakers and two presenters followed by Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first plenary speaker to you, Ms. Sai Jotermai Raturla, who is the program director at Aero. She has been working in the area of women's health and rights, and in particular SRHR, for the past 20 years. Her ex expertise includes monitoring and research around international commitments pertaining to women's health and SRHR, capacity strengthening, and also advocacy. Ms. Sai has also been actively engaged in the youth movement building for the SDGs in the region. Her topic today is Claiming and Redefining Rights, Older Women's Health and Well-Being in Asia and the Pacific Region at ICPD Plus 25. Welcome, Ms. Sai. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again um, on behalf of, um, um, you know, the APC RSHR, but also on behalf of Arrow. Uh, I hope you're all able to see the screen um, and I will be presenting the ICPD plus 25 findings on older persons, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights and overall health and well-being um, as part of the study that Arrow has conducted. Um, and this is part of the ICPD plus 25 review, which we have conducted in 19 Asian countries in the region. Um, so I would actually start off with, um, I'm not able to share the screen. Okay, so um, overall in terms of the statistical profile of older persons in the region, we see that uh, in 2019, an estimated 60.1% of the 702.9 million world's older people have been residing in the Asia and the Pacific region. So we see that a significant amount, I mean, you know, significant group of people are actually residing in the Asia Pacific region of whom women constitute 52.9% of the persons within this whole equation, which means that we have 60% of the world's older population living in the region of whom 52.9% uh, are women as such. Now, declines in the fertility and the mortality in the region have resulted in these fundamental changes in the age structures. We have at one end the youth dividend, there are uh, young uh, youth bulge that we see, but also we are seeing a uh, significant uh, older populations uh, in the region as such. Uh, and then, uh, and like all the population groups, older persons are not a homogeneous group. They are, So uh, older persons are not a homogeneous group and they come from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, immigrant, ethnic minorities, living in poverty uh, and with disability, living in emergencies, 
sexual and gender minorities, indigenous persons, persons living with HIV and sex workers, widows, single women. So this is what we want to ensure that like, you know, to say that this is not a homogeneous group. And as a result of which the discrimination based on age is combined with gender and the other diversities that we are talking about negatively or in some instances positively affecting the enjoyment of full range of human rights and dignity of older persons as such. Implications, in terms of implications, we see that the longevity revolution is there. It is globally there, it is regionally there, but the opportunities await to be harnessed. So, and that is what we will be discussing in the future slides. The demographic shifts that we are seeing have implications on health, on healthcare systems, on health workforce, on healthcare technologies, social protection, employment, quality of life, long term care of individuals, including in humanitarian and disaster response. Now, um, I think it will be important for us after looking at the statistical profile of the region in terms of older persons and also in terms of their diversity to look at what are all the different international commitments in regards to older persons. And the discussions have started as early as 1982 with the first World Assembly on Aging. And in 1991, at the, the 10th anniversary of the Vienna International Plan of Action on Aging, uh, UN principles for older persons have been adopted. And that focused on independence, on participation, on care, on dignity, and on other uh, issues. In 1992, the International Conference on Aging was adopted. Uh, and uh, that uh, conference basically adopted a proclamation on aging. Now, fast forward in 2002, uh, the political declaration and the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging has been adopted, and it focused on protecting uh, human rights, gender equality, human rights, fundamental freedoms of older persons, eliminating discrimination, including age-based discrimination, uh, ensuring there is dignity and eliminating of uh, all forms of neglect, abuse, and violence. So uh, while those are some of the international frameworks, but we also see the international conventions and the human rights frameworks also discussing uh, older persons issues, whether it is the international covenant on civil and political rights, the international covenant on civil, uh, uh, social, cultural, economic rights, whether it is the CEDAW, whether it is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, there have been mentions uh, to older persons. Now, in 2010, at the 47th session of the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, this adopted a general recommendation, number 27, on older women. And the recommendation includes policy recommendations, which focus on ensuring that the concerns of older women uh, are integrated into the national strategies and development initiatives. It also called for disaggregated statistics and uh, to improve the situation of um, older women, especially because that concerned with the CEDO as such. Now, we also have the International Conference on Population and Development, um, the Beijing Platform for Action, and the most recent Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. All of these documents have discussed aging in the outcome documents. Now, um, the entry point for us and the study that Arrow has done also focused on ICPD and hence I will go a, a little deeper into what the ICPD program of action has talked about older persons. A, it focused on improving the quality of life. It focused on developing systems of healthcare, economic and social security, paying special attention to the needs of women. It talked about enabling elderly people to lead self-determined, healthy and productive lives, eliminate all forms of discrimination, violence against elderly persons, paying spe special attention to the needs of elderly women. So overall, as a result of this, 
you see that there have been all these international documents that are talking about aging, that are talking about older persons, and closer to home, the sixth Asia-Pacific Population Conference Ministerial Declaration also talked about uh, adapting uh, health and social systems in response to the rising demand of elder care and support. It talked about implementing and monitoring laws and policies on the basis of gender equity and equality. It talked about strengthening the protection of the rights of older persons with the view of elimination of all forms of discrimination, abuse, and violence. It talked about including ageism in employment, healthcare sector, and other setting. And it also talked about health and, uh, um, and social protection systems as such. I think one important aspect here has also been in terms of adopting a life course approach by providing an integrated continuum of care, which includes preventive care, acute care, chronic disease management, lifelong care, and end-of-life care support, as well as palliative care. So this was a comprehensive uh, regional standard as such that came out of uh, the sixth International Population and Conference Ministerial Declaration. So as, as of now, what we have discussed is there are regional and international frameworks, human rights standards that relate to older persons, which can be used by all of us, um, whether we are advocates, whether we are activists, or we are program implementers, in order to ensure that the national policies take into account these uh, regional norms and standards. Coming to the region as such, and what are the trends in terms of aging? One is that the region is actually seeing an increase in the proportion of older persons. So in 2016, we see that 12.4% of population in the region were 60 years or older. And this has been projected to increase to become more than a quarter by 2050. Now, 12.4% of the population is the regional average, and we see that countries like Thailand, countries like um, Bangladesh, um, uh, countries like Vietnam have actually even crossed beyond this regional average, which means that uh, there are many countries in the region who are much above than this regional average of 12.4%. At the same time, we also see the other trend is in terms of an increase in the pace of aging. Now, when we talk about the pace of aging, we see that um, over a period of time in countries like France, when it took 115 years in order for societies to go from aging to aid societies, in our region, we see that countries like China, Thailand, and Vietnam have taken uh, about 25, 22, and 19 years respectively in order to uh, move from aging to aid societies. And this shows that the pace of aging in the region is actually dramatically um, uh, at a higher pace. The other trend that we also see is uh, even in countries with lower proportion of older persons, the absolute number of older persons can be quite significant. And that is what we see in certain subregions, and we also see that in certain countries in the region. Now, these demographic shifts these are having huge implications, as stated earlier, but are also um, uh, important for us to look at from the lens of SRHR information and services without stigma, discrimination, and violence. Now, as part of this ICPD plus 25 review that we have done, and we have produced this publication, which is available on our website, um, we looked at gender dimensions of aging, we looked at social protection for uh, older persons. We looked at uh, uh, older persons abuse, and we also looked at overall health and well-being of uh, older persons, of which we will share some of the findings. Now, in terms of gender dimensions, um, we see that in the Asia Pacific region, women outlive men by at least four years on average. Now, this is basically also in terms of the biological disposition that women tend to live longer, but we also see that this difference is as high as 13.2 years in the Republic of Korea and 12.7 years in Russian Federation. So this is uh, what we are seeing as women constituting, uh, and we have talked 
talked about this 52.7, which means that there are more women than men. And sorry for this very binary way of looking at uh, um, uh, at the gender, but this is what we have in terms of data, and that is another big gap that we are looking at. Now, uh, women's longer living uh, life expectancy and the consequent larger proportion of older women living alone throws challenges on a number of issues, whether it is about income security, whether it is on a discrimination based on limited access to resources, whether it is about health care, whether it is about adequate housing, whether it is about social protection, legal justice. And uh, older women uh, face greater risk of physical and psychological abuse due to discriminatory societal attitudes and non-realization of human rights of women. And there are also harmful traditional and customary practices that continue to exist, which exacerbate um, uh, uh, based on other background characteristics and which basically um, uh, see that women have a negative um, uh, realization of their overall health well-being um, um, at the time when they are old. Now, poverty is also related to the absence of economic opportunities, lack of um, uh, credit, lack of resources, and uh, this actually leads to their disempowerment. Um, and I Last two minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, if that's last two minutes, I would go to the uh, most important ones in terms of social protection. Um, so we have also studied uh, social protection um, uh, for older persons. And here we see that while the uh, while there are uh, many challenges that have been uh, there in terms of social protection, there are also countries uh, which are showing some good practices in terms of uh, having uh, integrated long-term care uh, for protection of older persons, whether it is in Japan, whether this is in Thailand, whether this is in uh, Vietnam as such. Now, but one thing we need to understand here is the pension funds in the region often only provide coverage for public sector, then uh, again, women lose out in this bargain. Uh, but also we need to check in terms of the coverage of these pension schemes, the size, the frequency, which do not provide for minimum subsistence level uh, income uh, as such of older persons. Now, abuse is a huge issue, but one thing that's most important here is that we do not have data, and uh, I think Sona has also talked about it, where uh, the data mostly is for women within the reproductive age group, which is 15 to 49, and we have uh, very little data that talks about uh, older persons' uh, health well-being and data around uh, all their um, uh, uh, livelihood aspects. But also there are uh, the definitions are also not consistent and this is also another issue that needs to be looked at. Now coming to uh, recommendations, I think it's very important for us to reclaim the framework suggested by the International Conference on Population and Development and the Beijing Platform for Action, which actually talk about a life course approach to women's health as a matter of human rights. So this needs to be taken into account. We need to have data in place data systems need to take into account uh, uh, older persons. We need to ensure that the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging is uh, fully implemented at the national level. We need to ensure that older persons are not left behind in all their diversity, which needs attention to the intersectionality aspects. Um, we also need to ensure that the health systems need to align. We need to include uh, universal health coverage that is inclusive of older persons. And, um, um, and uh, very importantly, human rights and gender equality are central to addressing the issue of aging in the Asia Pacific region and also taking into account the life cycle approach. If we can uh, bring in these aspects, um, I think a lot can be done in terms of implementing the existing uh, policies around uh, older women's health and well being, but also their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Sai. Thank you for your presentation. It's so rich and uh, we're looking forward to, to reading this uh, report. And uh, so I think everybody can visit the Arrow website to find this report, which is very timely as we are reviewing um, ICPD and Beijing policies as well. So uh, next up, we have uh, Ms. Caitlin Littleton she is Regional Program Advisor at Help Age International Asia Pacific Region 
and has played a key role in providing technical support on issues related to health and older people for health, help age programs, network members, and program partners in the Asia Pacific. She will give us an overview of sexual health of older people. Over to you, Caitlin. Um, thank you very much. It's um, a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, help age International works um, exclusively for older people and with governments and societies to help with adaptation to population aging and ensuring that the rights of older people are met. Um, but despite that, we do actually very little to do with sexual health. And I think that's one of the key kind of points that you'll see in this presentation um, is that both the aging uh, kind of aging and development sector and the sexual health and reproductive rights sector um, are perhaps um, failing when it comes to looking at sexual health and reproductive rights for older people. So um, I'll start by just sharing this presentation is just going to dig into some of the things that Sono sort of addressed in her opening. We're going to look at four key false beliefs about sexuality among older adults and then um, the impact of ageism on sexual and reproductive health and rights of older people. So the first belief is that older people aren't able to have sex. And as I go through these beliefs, I would like for you um, listening to consider if you have held these beliefs currently or in the past, and if it's commonly held belief in your um, family, neighborhood, community, culture. So older people aren't able to have sex. Um, well, we know that this isn't true, uh, at least not, not as a blanket statement. Inability to have sexual intercourse is most strongly linked with health issues rather than age specifically. Uh, although with that said, there are some kind of common trends um, in health conditions that can um, cause difficulties with sex and particularly sexual intercourse. Um, so postmenopausal uh, drops in estrogen can cause thinner and less elastic vaginal walls and vaginal dryness, and that can cause pain in intercourse. Erectile dysfunction is more common um, with later older ages, and that's largely related to underlying conditions um, like chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension and also medications that are used to treat and control those. But it is important to remember it doesn't affect all older men. Um, urinary incontinence and also prostate issues are more common with age and that can have an impact on, uh, on sex um, and also desire to have sex. And then mental health uh, and depression and cognitive health, and we'll look in other slides at a few other factors that are related to, um, uh, to more of the um, psychosocial and uh, mental health related aspects. Um, so those things can, um, can have an impact on that, but it is just important, and I think Sai said it really well, that it's so important that you don't think about older people as a homogenous group. There is so much diversity within the group of people that are over the age of 60 and up to 100 and something, and you just can't think of them as one homogenous group. Um, I also wanted to point out on this slide that a lot of the research really focuses on sexual intercourse. And so most of what people are talking about when they say do or don't have sex, et cetera, is related to that. But of course, sexual intercourse is not the only means for sexual, physical, and emotional intimacy. And many of the studies that have looked at um, older ages, so for example, over 80 years old, have found that while sexual intercourse is um, only a part of the sexual behavior of a relatively, like, medium-sized minority, maybe 20% or 30% of people, other forms of sexual intimacy are quite common. Um, second belief is that older people don't want to have sex, um, but the truth is that many older people continue to desire sex for the same reasons that younger age groups do, including pleasure and closer relationships, reducing stress, increased well-being, it's the same. Um, of course, I add many and most and some because as I said, you need to remember the diversity um, among groups. And of course, there are younger people that also do not desire to have sex. And there are some older people that do not desire to have sex and um, that is individual. Um, so older women are more likely to report reduced desire for sex, but the 
statistics and the data don't really dig into why that is. I mean, there is some discussion of um, the relationship between estrogen drops uh, uh, post menopause and that effect on libido. Um, but there are a lot of other questions around that. And when you look at interviews or qualitative studies where older women are talking about this, some of them, um, you know, describe having never really enjoyed sex that much. And then, you know, now they have kind of an excuse not to, they feel they have an excuse not to continue participating in it. Um, so I think this is one kind of question. There's physical, there could be these other things that need to be addressed, um, physical issues, for example. And if they aren't, um, or if, they're, if they are, for example, widowed and they're not interesting, interested in seeking out um, a casual partner or in remarrying, that can be another reason. Um, chronic health issues, I sort of touched on this, but they, uh, as well as for men, can play a role in reduced desire for sex. Um, and it is affected, but not necessarily to the degree that we thought. Now, I should just say that the English Longitudinal Study of Aging data is um, one of only three um, aging surveys that include questions about sexual health and practices. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's why I'm using an example outside of Asia Pacific. We don't have any studies from within Asia Pacific that are large scale on this. Um, but they found that um, only 11% of older women and 15% of older men listed low sexual desire as a key sexual health concern. So that's not really something that is um, a huge factor for many people. Um, belief number three is that older people shouldn't have sex, and this is um, uh, something that we see in a lot of age groups where people are saying um, what other people or other genders or people of different sexual orientation, orientations should do or shouldn't do. Um, but of course, every adult should be able to fully uh, express and safely express their sexuality with respect to the rights of others. And this is such an external viewpoint because if you ask, um, you know, older people themselves, you know, they might not have the same viewpoint, but if you ask younger people, there's very strong um, kind of universal common view reinforced by media, reinforced by societal norms that it's um, not dignified or that it's shameful. The only um, trope that we kind of hear is that a man that is interested in sex is a dirty old man. That's a kind of a common um, way that sexuality of older people is discussed, but especially among older women, uh, sexuality is just, it, they're assumed to be asexual. Um, and some older people do internalize this. Like so if you do start, you see some surveys that where older people themselves will say, I don't think it's appropriate at my age to be having sex, but that's a very small major minority. Most people, it's an, it's an external kind of societal pressure. And it is similar to those issues that are faced by other groups where other people are saying, you shouldn't do this um, or you should do this and kind of a control around um, sexual practice that leaves the autonomy and decision-making out of the hands of the individual or at least pressures or shames people. Belief number four is that older people don't have sex. I mean, this is kind of a compilation of the other ones but I, I thought I'd save it for last. There's not a lot of survey data that is very strong on this and particularly not from Asia Pacific and many countries I couldn't find any data from. Um, but just as with at any age, there's a large variety in sexual frequency, activities, and satisfaction. Cultural beliefs and norms, marital status, gender and sex, sexual orientation, and physical and mental health all influence sexual practice. So the global survey of sexual behavior, which I think many of the participants today who are coming from the sexual and reproductive health and rights angle would be familiar with, had about 9% of the respondents over the age of 65 from those 26 countries. And there's such diversity in responses um, across different countries. For example, this is across all age groups. 69% of Indian respondents agreed that sex is beneficial for general health and well-being compared to 30% of Japanese and 28% of Thai respondents. And 61% of Indian respondents reported full satisfaction with their sex life, while only 15% of Japanese and 35% of Thai and 35% of Singaporean respondents did. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you just, as we were talking about, you can really just have to see there's a lot of diversity in this. 
A sizable minority of older people remain sexually active throughout their life, particularly when you consider sexual activities other than intercourse. So when you do see survey data, you're seeing that, it, like for example, this table is from this um, global survey. In that 65 plus column, 42% across the 26 countries were fully satisfied with their um, frequency of sex and their quality of sex. And 40% were having sex weekly, which is a, a decline from that age group in 20 to 49, but it's not, um, it's not a very small percentage. So I just bring to you some pictures to remind you of who we are talking about. Okay, so ageism has already been brought up, but I just wanted to bring it back to the group that ageism is the stereotyping um, that's in your head and the prejudices that come from those stereotypes. And then the action is the discrimination that comes out of those stereotypes and prejudices. Um, so that is stereotyping prejudice and discrimination on the basis of their age. And of course, ageism affects every aspect um, of later life. There's a lot of assumptions, for example, that all older people are frail or sickly or weak, or that older people should do, um, shouldn't work or can't work. We see it with discriminatory practices around, for example, who is eligible for loans, credit and loans, um, or we see upper age limits on a variety of things that really don't need to have them. Um, but it also intersects with sexism and rigid gender roles. So that like, for example, older women um, may be expected to have a complete uh, service oriented attitude towards their children and grandchildren with um, no real ability for them to have their own life uh, and homophobia, ableism I've discussed. Ageism says older people are no longer sexual beings. It assumes that they were sexual beings before and that they are no longer. Um, but when you think about the sexual health definition, um, this is something that should apply to people of all ages and intrinsic to the right to sexual health are a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships and the possibility of having sexual experiences that are pleasurable and safe and free from coercion, discrimination, violence, and disease. Um, so all of these um, beliefs that we looked at before end up becoming a major barrier to the sexual health for older people for reasons that Sono and Sai have also um, alluded to. Older people are excluded from um, sexual and reproductive health and rights research on sexual health with upper age limits, you know, only looking at people up to age 50 or 55. Um, research on LGBTQI, excluding older um, people, research on sexually transmitted infections, sexual violence and abuse research. Um, there's not this consideration, even though we know that it occurs, I think people think it doesn't. Um, and then sexual health issues are ignored by research on aging and health. And so longitudinal surveys on aging and health in India, China, Japan, the new ones in Philippines and Vietnam, none of those include any questions about sexual health at all. And, um, and only the only ones that really do right now are the, the newest version of the English longitudinal survey, some in Australia and uh, one or two in the US. So this is something that really um, we need to be addressing from that side. Um, yeah. Caitlin, in, last, last minute or so. Okay, so please wrap the upper up. age Thanks. limits are used in the SDG for gender equality. So the proportion of women aged 14, 15 to 49 who make their own informed decisions regarding sexual relations. So there's an exclusion in the indicator of all these women over 50. And the number of countries with laws and regulations that guarantee women ages 15 to 49 access to sexual and reproductive health care. Older people are excluded from sexual health programming. They're not um, included in sexual health education, um, communication about how to pr protect from STIs, distribution, um, screening, checkups. That social and health services aimed towards older people ignore sexual health. So for example, in care settings, there's a um, complete blindness to the thought that some people may be sexually active. Negative societal messages can detract from individual enjoyment, such as only young people can be attractive. It's inappropriate or disgusting for older people to express sexual desire, or this focus on sexual intercourse as the only thing, and often male sexual pleasure. The last slides are not, these are rep repetitive now, but I just wanted to make the point that with um, 
such a large percentage of the population over 60, you cannot meet the SDG that Sona was speaking about without addressing the sexual and reproductive health needs of older people. So we've discussed the first point a lot, I won't say it again. And I think that dismantling ageist views and discriminatory practices are essential in achieving progress on sexual health, right to health, women's rights, LGBTQI rights, and older people's rights. So I hope that we together can help to dismantle ageism with regards to sexuality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, again, so important to realize that sexual health is really a big part of quality of life for people. And um, really, uh, your presentation walked us through some of these common beliefs. And it really highlighted also the absence of data and research. Uh, very keenly felt that there's no uh, good data set or research that's out there, but luckily we have two researchers that are coming up uh, later in this session who are actually doing this research now. So we'll have some um, really interesting information that we could share with everybody. So uh, thank you, Caitlin, again. And our third plenary speaker is Mr. Krishna Murari Gautam, who works as an independent consultant for rural development planning and training. He has worked in India, Nepal, and China for rural development programs and projects, and is the founder and chairperson of Aging Nepal, an NGO working for the rights and welfare of the elderly. He has written over seven books and booklets on aging issues, and his plenary talk is titled, Not Leaving Older Adults Behind in the Process of Achieving SDGs. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Gautam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson and distinguished guests and speakers. It was a very educational uh, session for me. I learned a lot and I, 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 I had pre previous some, made some idea what could I be saying. But listening to our Sai and Kathleen, uh, actually Kathleen is from HelpAge. HelpAge is our mother organization of Aging Nepal because we are global network member. So I think she covered very well. So whatever I will be saying today about older person uh, may, sound, may sound very uh, general. Here my hypothesis is this social development goals, this global sustainable development goals, this whole world is crying about cannot be made without involving older people in the process and making them as a shareholder of the benefits or whatever we get from the success or failure of uh, sustainable development goals. That's what uh, I, I believe and uh, that is the point I would like to uh, you know, put some emphasis on. So it is not about only world people, it is about the global goals that will not be achieved. So world, older people are not alone and we are not the uh, ch charity people receiving charity and kindness. It is simply we are not, we are thrown out of the society of today. Thank you. Next. Next up, you know, this is very old slide. I think we all are very familiar with. Uh, uh, this is the population structure of, uh, as stipulated or by United Nations in 2007, the trend remains the same. Uh, the crossing point between the two lines, between this line drawn for the uh, youth uh, or the child under five and, and this 65 years age, uh, older people. If we see the population of these people in crossing point, this crossing point varies with the country and the time, right? But we are already here. Most of the country and society are all already in this uh, right side corner of, uh, of this curve. But our politician, our policy makers, our programs, our education system, whatever we have developed in our society, our government, and all, I mean all parts of government and all its functionary, they are still are not aware of what goes on in this part of the population, in this corner of the population structure. So, and let's take, uh, we are here, 
but we are still you will find many older people you know coloring their head or dyeing their head to look belong to trying to well, what does that mean is someone you know older person with white hair to, uh, tries to put uh, black on his uh, make his hair black i mean in our asia pacific region that simply means the psychology of that person is to belong to this group who is not so this confidence so our this the in this section of the uh, the population structure population structure the old people are still afraid to be old afraid to to look old so they try all sort of thing to not look old and look young looking young and being healthy are two totally different and similarly about aging about this population structure what i believe is that uh, we have not prepared enough human resources to realize these 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 needs uh, people's need of this reason and we are still fighting with uh, we are living here in this situation but fighting our age old practices and social stigma we are still holding the same old values same planning commission same problem uh, 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 financial uh, annual budget of the government same structure same ministry same people and and they are simply they tend to continue whatever they have been doing and trend doing for so many so many years so and we have not emphasizing enough education training and campaign though here pays which is my the aging nepal's mother organization and i'm proud to say that is uh, we have been doing that campaign 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 and for example i'll give you uh, one simple example you know i i i, I had to go through this uh, through this uh, uh, prostate operation because it had to be operated i didn't know and suddenly it found that it was too big then doctor told me only one simple thing it is not your health problem it is the health problem of, of our society because our radio our tv our our any any media never tell people older people of 50 plus is that please check your uh, uh, prostate and had i had, had i checked it had someone told me that my prostate after 50 years of age then i would have uh, I would have to go through the uh, go through the uh, operation that I did. So our education system, our information system, simply our society that that is that belongs to this population structure is not is not working, uh, not thinking, not operating in the way it should be considered in this population structure because sometimes even i find myself behaving as if i belong to this population structure so it is the total overhaul uh, my uh, say so that we don't have to deal with uh, myths uh, which can be presented very well but but yes there, there are so many myths about it but does our sex education uh, that we give to our children and our elders do we include the sexual behavior of older person do we include like ageism uh, like uh, uh, to, uh, told us ageism okay uh, like elder abuse uh, did we include those in our education system at, at this point i would like to say because i'm also belong to a poet group or creative writing group so let me say that and people know me more as a poet uh, i'm more popular in my country as a poet than the person working for older person why uh, i just ask why because this literature you know like song uh, poems short stories all that uh, because that that reaches to the largest number of population and it really changes the psychology and makes make people understand it's not only the data it's not only the theory it is the through the literature it, it is well digested information if, if we pull through poems if we saw but if we see our older people's presence in the literature when it we have 
children's literature, youth literature in my country. I don't know about many other countries where there is also, you know, women literature. What about what what about the literature of older person? You know, of all types of feeling that if older person goes in that age, like it goes generally in our literature, it says nine types of feeling, nine groups. There is love, there is anger, there is, uh, you know, you don't know what you are doing, you know, uh, there is bravery and there is everything, all the, basically nine types of feeling. So all that feeling that's, that older people has to go, you know, in, in their real life when they are young, they really go through. But uh, when they are old, the literature is gone. So when a person is old, we, we, we throw them out to Ramayana, Mahabharata or Bible or some, some religious book and that's it for you. So, so that's, that's, we are not producing enough literature, enough information system and our old system is still, we are, we belong to this group and behaving as if whatever we learned a long time back. And until unless we change that, our SDG has to be achieved in, by, by, the, by this group, for this group. And that, that's why I say without, without involving older people in the mainstream of the society, SDG, which, which the whole world is crying for, uh, will not be a success for only one reason. How can any objective of the global objective could be achieved? by leaving out 16 or 20 percent of the population out of the whole system. So it is undoable work. And yes, Daisy, uh, second slide, please. Second slide, uh, that I would like to highlight that uh, these sustainable development goals, that, that goals that the whole world is uh, committed to, but its commitment is political in nature. It is not legal binding and we know what politicians do and what their commitment means. So we cannot put any country to the international court for not achieving any uh, sustainable development goals. So it is not about uh, one group of people. It is not about one the older people or young people or of any other, uh, other age group. It is the entire humanity which is going to fail for only one reason that we are not including older people in the mainstream of the society. Now, if you ask me why, how to, how, how to include them, it's simple, you know, uh, like uh, both uh, uh, Sai and Kathleen told, Kathleen told us, uh, you know, it is the enabling environment. Have we given, uh, we have children literature, we have uh, uh, we have youth literature. We have adult uh, adult education. But do we have university for the older people to whatever they want to learn, especially the new technology? Why we say the older people are not productive and they are they are not useful? They are there. They are, nobody. We are scared to be old. Why? 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 Why we are threatening them? Because. Uh, we are rendered to be useless, you know, nobody talks about our issues, no media is uh, informed about us, no policy maker is informed, and there is no education and training system for us, no, no technical training is given to us, all our knowledge is nobody willing to hear, so we, are, we have to, with that question, lead me to ask only one question that I believe in from the core of my heart, I am here today because I was a literate person and you all are here today because you are a literate person and in Nepal itself, now more than 90% of the older women of Nepal are illiterate today because in their time when they had to go to school, there were no as many school and girl education was, was almost a social taboo and from there, a grandmom today may have a, a very highly educated daughters and son, but she is still an illiterate who cannot operate a telephone, who cannot operate television. So I would focus and I would request whatever our concerns are, like research and, and many other things, 
uh, that my early, earlier speakers highlighted. Let us start from the education. Education, education, and education is what enables people, strengthens people, and the changes can come through education. I see our chairperson is already here. So thank you, chairperson. Krishna Ji, two more minutes. <laughs> Yeah, Thank so you. All, all these data I would like, I don't want to go into it because I didn't know the knowledge and experience we'll have in, in our presentation today. But with all this, with my emphasis on education as the main pillar of life, of empowerment, of enabling people, we know other things, ageism, why, 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 why we, we suffer elder abuse? Because neither they know, <laughs> other ears would know that they should not abuse me, neither I know that I should not be abused. I am not, my, why my human right is um, violated? Because I am not aware of my human right. So my earlier, earlier generation, they established the basic human right for the entire population. And today, we, the older person, who are the older person, are uh, you know, we are not given our basic human right to education, to health, the right to our economic freedom. Uh, why? It's simply because we are rendered useless. The society makes us business, uh, uh, useless uh, because we are not trained in the present day society or all, all this digital technology. And nobody know where they are in the in the country. We have education system to train us, give us digital literacy, give us our our literacy that we gave you, and then we'll be enabled. That will be enabling environment, and then we can be productive and useful to the society. And and we know how to how, how to do things. And whatever the youth of today who think. They know the technology, they are highly educated and also the very digitally literate. My, my friend, I would like to warn you that when you get 75 years of age, when you are retired, then there will be totally different new technologies and that needs another education and training and you will find no institution to go and learn those things. Then again, you will be rendered uh, you know, useless or non-productive in your old age, like the old, old people of today's society are rendered useless simply because they are illiterate, they are ill-informed, and they are unaware of their own rights. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Mr. Gautam. And, uh, yeah, thank you also for sharing your personal experience with us and how important preventive health campaigns are uh, for the older people and, and that the information ed education systems are currently really failing us in many aspects. And um, I really liked your point about using popular culture and artistic expressions to, to really change that environment. and and really create you know, a new culture that is much more inclusive of the older persons. And um, there are some things that we could do ourselves, like you know, using more images of older people in our presentations, for example. It's something that uh, we often don't think about, but it may be able to make a difference as well. Um, so thank you so much. We would love to hear more from you in the, during the Q&A. So, um, I will turn now to the next speaker. And um, so, so here we have now two uh, abstract, abstract presenters and we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Tay Nai Ping, who has been an associate professor at the Department of Applied Statistics, Faculty of Economics and Administration at the University of Malaya. He was coordinator of the Population Studies Unit of the University until 2018. And he's also worked as research director at the National Population and Family Development Board. His research interest is on aging, gender issues, and population dynamics. And he will talk to us today about the sexual behavior of older men and women in Malaysia. Welcome, Dr. Tay Nai Ping. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Three willing. Madam Chair, present, and uh, good afternoon to participants and fellow presenters and panelists. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking the conference organizer for inviting us to present our paper on understanding the sexual behavior of older men and women in Malaysia. I'm very honored to be to join the group by experts on population aging and sexuality. Uh, this paper was written jointly with three of my colleagues as listed uh, on the slide. Okay, um, as mentioned by Madam Chair and uh, previous speakers, uh, there are lots of misconceptions and, uh, and uh, on se of sexuality in later life. The stereotype view of aging and social prejudice consider older adults asexual and disinterested in sex. However, the literature shows a growing evidence that sexual desires and activity persist into old age. Okay, um, by presenting the empirical findings based on a population survey, we hope to dispel some misconception that older people are no longer interested in sex and are not engaging in sex. Let me begin by giving you some brief information about Malaysia. Um, Malaysia is a multi-ethnic uh, country with a population of 32.7 million. The Malaysian population is aging rapidly due to increased longevity and fertility decline to below replacement level since uh, 2012. Older people age 60 and over make up 10% of the population and this is projected to reach 25% in 2050. The 2010 population census show that 83% of older men and 54% of older women were currently married. Next, uh, about data and methods for this paper. The data for this uh, paper came from the Malaysian Population and Family Survey conducted in 2014 by the National Population and Family Development Board. The senior sample covered a total of 4,059 respondents aged 60 and over. However, this analysis is confined to 2,703 currently married respondents. The dependent variable are the responses to the question on do you still go hand, cut, kiss, communicate, share dates, and have sex with your partner? We use uh, descriptive statistics and multiple logistic regression analysis for this paper. Now, the study variables, here's our distribution. Uh, as I mentioned, 59% male and 41% female based on the career merit sample. Uh, This compared to a ratio of 45 to 55 for the total sample. If we are looking at the total sample, it's more female than male. Malay make up about two thirds of the sample and the non-Malays comprising the Chinese, Indian and other indigenous population make up the rest. Half of the respondent had primary education and 30% had secondary education. Only 7% had tertiary education. More males than female had at least secondary schooling. About half of the respondents rated their health as fair and wanted as good and the rest poor. 36% of the males were currently working compared to only 15% among the females. Next, the result. Okay. Older men were more likely than older women to engage in all forms of intimate acts, especially in sexual activity. About 5% of the older couples were not communicating and about one fifth were not sleeping together. Three out of four older persons reported the acts of holding hands with their partners and about two out of three were engaged in hugging and kissing. Now, 57% of older males and 47% of older females reported having sex. Okay, here is the relationship between intimate acts and uh, sexual activity. All forms of intimate acts decrease with age. 
men having sex decreased from 73% among those 64, 60 to 64 to 30% among those age 75 and above. The corresponding figure for females were 58% and 17% respectively. Now, if we look at uh, in terms of ethnicity, the Malays were more likely than the non-Malays to engage in all forms of intimate acts, as you can see from the slide here. Okay, all acts of intimacy are positively associated with education. Those with tertiary education were twice as likely as those with no schooling to have sex. Part of the educational differentials are due to the age structure. The average age for those with no schooling was 69 years, compared to 65 years among those with tertiary education. Older males who were still working were more likely than those their non-working counterparts to engage in all forms of intimate acts. <clears throat> For the female, those who work were slightly more likely than their non-working counterparts to share beds and to have sex. Okay, next on the health status. The health status is a, a very important determinant of all forms of intimacy. Those who sell with good health were much more likely than those with poor health to report having sex. As you can see, it's 59% compared to 40% on the last panel. Chronic diseases. Chronic diseases, including high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and asthma, reduce the likelihood of all forms of intimate acts. The proportion engaged in sex among those with various chronic diseases were 5 to 9 percentage points lower than those without the diseases. The various intimate acts are important precursor to sexual activity. Those with, who reported acts of holding hands, hugging and kissing were 3 to 4 times more likely to engage in sex as compared to those who did not. Among the few who did not talk to their spouse, none of the men reported having sex. Those who slept together with their spouse were six to seven times more likely to have sex than those who had not who did not sleep together. The data may include those who are living apart. For both male and female, <coughs> a higher proportion of Malay were more likely than the non-Malay to engage in sex across all age groups. Okay, um, erectile dysfunction. Uh, it was estimated as 17% for this survey. Now the proportion of men who had Erectile dysfunction increased from 12% among those aged 60 to 64 to 27% among those 75 and older. How does it affect your sexual performance? Those with ED were much less likely than those with, without ED to engage in sex, that is 32% compared to 62%. Interestingly, ED did not prevent 32% of the men from engaging in sex. This could be due to the inclusion of uh, oral sex. Now we did some uh, logistic regression. Here's the result. The re <coughs> variables included in the logistic regression include age, gender, ethnicity, work status, child return health, and various acts of intimacy. Most of these variables are statistically significant. The significant bivariate relationship between education and having sex became insignificant after adjusting for age and other acts of intimacy. Spousal communication has the largest odds ratio, as you can see, but it was significant only at key value of less than 0 0.05 because only 5% were not talking to each other. The intimate acts were significant predictors of sexual activity among older people. 
nice satisfaction. Other individuals were reported being engaged in the various intimate acts reported higher life satisfaction than those who did not. You can see uh, for both men and women. Now to sum up, most uh, Malaysians had an intimate relationship with their spouse, be it, you know, kissing, hugging, and you know, holding hands. Acts of intimacy are important precursors to sex. Age, gender, ethnicity, health condition, and chronic diseases, birth status were significant predictors of sexual behavior of older people. Intimate acts and sexual activity are, activity are associated with life satisfaction. Our finding collaborate uh, the lack of um, a survey in uh, 2010 where they reported 62 percent of men and 51 percent of women engaged in sexual activity now the lack of uh, research on age uh, age sexuality in malaysia is reflecting on the social cultural factors setting the perception of OA sexuality and this must be changed the various ethnic groups have their own religion customs and <laughs> The ethnic difference here in security may be reflective of these cultural differences. Health is a significant predictor of sexual behavior, and the rapid rise of chronic diseases will affect the sexual functioning of older adults. To be able to enjoy a satisfactory sexual life, the older people must maintain good health, good sexual functioning, and positive sexual self esteem. Maintaining an intimate relationship is crucial for the sexual and life satisfaction in later life. There are some limitations uh, to this uh, paper. First, the data for this MSA is somewhat outdated. Uh, it was in 1974 when the survey was conducted. The question on sexual intimacy were rather general and do not refer to a specified time period, such as last week or last month. This analysis was based on individual response as sex involves husband and wife, and analysis based on couples may be more appropriate. Moreover, the lack of um, common ID includes evaluation of the consistency of response between the spouses. As the National Population and Family Development Board is planning for the upcoming survey in 2021. The lesson from this webinar will provide useful inputs for the question and design. The survey may consider questions on sexual satisfaction, design for sexual intercourse, family support problems, and concern with sexual functioning, and treatment required and so on. We would also like to propose <coughs> a mixed method approach. A combination of quantitative and qualitative approaches will enable us to gain a better understanding of all its sexuality. As a conclusion, sexuality is a lifelong need. Sexual activity remains an important aspect of life among older people and uh, older men and women. Education, healthcare, cultural practices, social media, and the family have important roles in sustaining a happy and healthy sexual life in old age. The SRS program should cater to the needs of the rapidly increasing number of older persons who require reproductive health counseling and services. Of this webinar, let us advocate the provision of SRA services for older people as an integral component of the national health policy. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Tain. I think your, your study really um, will attract a lot of questions. So we want to make sure there are lots of time, there's lots of time for Q&A. Um, I was especially interested in seeing that table on uh, intimate acts by chronic diseases. I think that's uh, very intriguing. And um, we really hope that your research could um, reach health professionals 
and and increase their awareness about old age sexuality and how to have these conversations with with their patients more so thank you so much and uh, let me turn now to our second abstract presenter who is actually my good friend and it's dr <laughs> sun Xiaoming from china he is professor in the school of Sociology and Population Sciences, Nanjing University of Posts and Telecommunications. But earlier, he was a professor and vice president at Nanjing College for Population Program Management. Dr. Sun is very well known for his research on demography, public health, and behavioral sciences, focusing on quality of reproductive health and family planning services. And his presentation will address the important topic of unmet needs on sexual and reproductive health among women aged 50 to 64 in rural China. Welcome and excited to hear your remarks, Dr. Sun. Okay. Um, uh, my uh, presentation, uh, the title is uh, Unmet Needs. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, my presentation title is Unmet Needs on Sexual and Reproductive Health Among Women Aged 50 to 64 in Rural China. Actually, this is a research project is supported by the Social Sciences Fund of China. So uh, this is the map, China. Almost the same area as the United States with total population of 1.4 billion. So the, I must uh, tell you that the research background, China has been implementing its national family planning program since the beginning of the 1980s. And the total fertility rate has fallen far below the replacement level, 1.4 in 2015, resulting in a special public structure with a massive proportion of middle-aged women, particularly women aged 50 to 64 years who nowadays greatly a number of women in early reproductive ages. So this picture shows us the total fertility rate, national population policy and innovative program in China since 1970 to 2015. So as you know, the China applied a very unique population policy since uh, actually since the early 1980s is a one child policy. So, um, you can see the red lines, the total fertility rate, it declined you know, sharply and it continues to decline until the 2015. The China find that is really the problem of the very low fertility and the population aging issue. So the public uh, policy change to two child policy for each family. So in, to, uh, in 2010 census, there were an estimated 76.7 million women aged 50 to 64 years who had made great contributions to the national family planning movement when they were younger. They now represent about 11.8 of the total 650 million female, pop female population in China and the size of this age group is continuously growing. So this is the, uh, the pyramid of China in year 2015, you can find that a big portion of the elderly people and also less, you know, population, the young, young, young population. This is really the big problem in China because of the almost uh, 30, more than 30 years uh, restricted population policy. So China's family plan program mainly focused on married women aged 15 to 49 years providing contraceptive services only. After reaching age 50 years, Chinese women are no longer eligible for free sexual and reproductive health services under this program. Because the Fan Pan program in China is free for everybody, but after 50 years, it's not free. And then many women, especially those in the rural areas have limited uh, access to the healthcare from other sources. China's system for family planning and maternal child health services have functioned separately since the early 1980s because of family planning 
uh, program study have left over uh, cover, coverage uh, gap, gaps that may exclude women aged 50 to 64 years from needed services. Little is known about their sexual and reproductive health demands and MNEs associated with the past contraceptive use and the menopause related problems. So we decided to, to do a research project. So these circumstances result in two challenges to the care of Chinese middle-aged women. One, serving a rapidly expanding segment of the population. And two, integrating sex and reproductive health services into existing health care system. So we don't want to still uh, continue to separate these two systems because of the, uh, the family planning policy changed to uh, two children. So there's a, our research project is conduct a nationwide survey for an assessment of reproductive health status, service demands, and unmet needs among women aged 50 to 64 in rural areas. Second, we would like to design, to design a population-based national project focused on reproductive health promotion for women aged 50 to 64 through existing family planning service network in rural China. So that methodology we applied, we, we undertook this large population-based survey in seven provinces in China to examine sexual and reproductive health demands and unmet needs among women aged 50 to 64 years. So this study examined the women about sexual and reproductive issues, source of information, carrying the health status, service needs, access to health services and the quality of services. So this is uh, what uh, our study size in rural area in, in, in green color. We selected seven provinces from east part of China, middle part of China, and the west part of China to make a representative sample of China. We used uh, three steps. You know, finally, we, we got uh, our women aged 50 to 64 were recruited in selected 24 uh, 28 villages. We uh, interviewed all the women in these 28 villages uh, with the age of uh, between age and uh, 50 to 64 years. So we finally uh, we got 1,652 study subjects uh, for the study. Then we used the inter uh, interview the questionnaire survey. Uh, was conducted by the wheelchair and the family planning workers to do it. So the data analysis, we first examined the demographic characteristics. Then second, among the, you know, uh, the post-menopause women who had used an IUD, we examined with the multiple logistic regression, the association of IUD removal as a dictometer's outcome with the participant's education vocation knowledge and so on. So I must mention to you that the, because of very restricted national family planning policy 20, uh, 30 years ago, so the, almost half of Chinese married women in the rural area, they had had IUD insertion. They suggested to take this one because it's long fact, you know, uh, low side effects. So most of, um, almost half of the rural women, they have had IUD insertion. So this is the, the the biggest uh, contraceptive use in the rural area. So the, uh, I would like to quickly uh, show you the, the some tables the, about several results about the uh, pregnancy history, abortion history, and the maternal child health care status, and health status in menopause period. This is what we have, we focused on. Uh, focused on, we find that, you know, the climacteric syndrome is a medical term that means uh, the uh, psychological or physical problems during the period of women's menopause. Menopause. So the big find, the the, the biggest finding, we find that the IUD removed after menopause among the five uh, five hundred nineteen people. It's almost 20% of them after menopause that did not have IUD removed. It's a big public health issues in China recently. 
and the reproductive health services and the, uh, the health demands and some uh, RTI, re re reproductive tract infections uh, issues here. So I would like to say so in, in words, about 39% uh, had abortion at least once and 11.7 had abortion more than twice during their lifetime. 3.9% had abortion last year. The prenatal care for the last baby delivery in their lifetime was only 18.18%. Almost 80% of them had for baby delivery in home, and 73.8% of them reported no one visited them after baby delivery for this uh, uh, middle-aged and early elderly age population. And 52.4 uh, uh, reported climacteric syndrome, syndrome, and the, uh, the mean frequency of sex in the last month was 1.8 times, about 47. 0.4% of women had undergone a gynecological examination during the past two years. 57.3% uh, reported that women suffered ITIs through a physical checkup, and only 41% of them had formal medical treatment. The first choice for care was the family planning uh, clinic, followed by the township hospitals. So the identified service needs included women's health checkups, the first one. The second is sexual health knowledge they needed, they want. The women's health knowledge and the menopause counseling and IUD removal after uh, menopause. So that, uh, that what uh, uh, they want in the future. So I would like to focus on the problems related to the IUD use. This is a quite unique problems in China because it's different from other countries. So China's fan plan program mainly focus on the uh, uh, the woman aged uh, 15 to 49. So after reaching age uh, uh, 50, women in China are no longer eligible for the free sexual and reproductive health service and this program. So that is what we use the multi, uh, multivariate logistic regression to analyze the influence factors towards the IUD uh, remove, removal. So a modified 519 uh, post-menopause women who used an IUD, 19.1% uh, had not had it removed. We find uh, the influence factors as follows. One, awareness of carry, uh, correct time for IUD removal. Second, re beliefs about sex after menopause. Third, receiving form formal health education. The last ones undergone gynecological exam examination was significantly associated with having had IUD removal. So we can find that the lack of service provision on sexual and reproductive health was the most important influence factor on IUD intention in rural China. So what we have learned, the survey showed that the reproductive health knowledge was not well disseminated and some misunderstanding existed among them. The large part of middle-aged women in rural China is still lack of the quality, reproductive health, and family planning services, particularly in the period around their menopause. A large proportion of women aged 50 to 64 in rural China lack quality sexual, sexual and reproductive health services, particularly IUD removal for the post-menopausal women. The family planning services are responsible, it's our opinion. We, we, we said it's a national family planning policy initiated 30 years ago. So that most of the women, they, have, they, they are suggested to have IUD insertion. But right now the family planning services are responsible to have IUD removed for women after their menopause. But the services are relatively poor. China is facing a new challenge of rapid population aging so that a comprehensive framework of reproductive health and family planning services should be well designed and the service priority for middle-aged women should be focused, particularly for the, uh, the women aged 50 to 64. So it is necessary to conduct a population-based reproductive health promotion for middle-aged women delivery through existing maternal child health and family planning service network in rural China. So it's good news to, uh, for, for us. 
after we uh, finished our study and we submitted the report to the National Fan Planning uh, uh, Association, so uh, based on our research results, the National Family Planning Association has proposed and been implementing a comprehensive reproductive health service program for middle-aged women since, 90, uh, since 2019, particularly for safe IUD removal, which is included into existing primary health care services, free of charge for all the women aged 50 to 64 in rural China. So the China is uh, right now is going to uh, try to shift from the family planning and uh, reproductive health to the family health care it's because of it's uh, driven by a growing middle-aged and elderly population, particularly in the rural area. So I'm currently leading a research group to follow up this uh, national action and, and to evaluate the effects and to follow up uh, uh, the, the educational uh, program in China. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sun. And um, it's so interesting to hear that your research has actually led to some of these policy recommendations and, and actions on the ground. So I'm very encouraged by, by that and also you know, really um, underscoring the need to reach out to these rural populations when we're talking about universal health coverage and meeting the SDGs by 2030. So thank you so much for sharing China's experience with us. Yeah, thank you, Sono. So uh, as, as several speakers have said earlier, we know that aging not only intersects with functional disabilities, but also many other challenges like inability to keep up with digital innovations, as Mr. Gautam emphasized in his talk, or loss of social networks. And then de these days, we really cannot forget their vulner vul vulnerability to climate change and natural disasters. So there are also issues of elder abuse, as Sai mentioned in her talk. And then there's housing issues, there's financial hardship, in the face of non-existent social safety nets, and then the lack of employment or training and self-advancement opportunities for older people. So how are we going to assure universal health coverage and improve quality of life of everyone so that no one is left behind by 2030? And um, in my view, intersectional pro problem solving requires actors who are really willing to co-create and collaborate with unlikely partners and integrate health programs for the elderly into a variety of platforms. So again, like Mr. Gautam said, including positive messages uh, about the elderly in art, for example, that's a cross-sectoral collaboration. But most importantly, I think health professionals also need to be sensitive to the sexual and reproductive health needs of older persons and make sure that this is a natural part of their regular conversations with patients during routine checkups. Sexual rights, as we know, are part of human rights. So we have to aim for a world in which everyone, regardless of their age, sexual orientation, gender identity or marital status, has the right to sexual health free of discrimination. And as societies, we need to respect those rights and create an atmosphere in which people are not stigmatized for discussing sexual and reproductive health issues because of age. So let me turn the floor now to Shoba and uh, she will moderate the Q&A sessions. And thank you so much again, everyone, for joining today. Thank you very much, Sono. And this must have been an, a unique experience for you in the sense that you started on 13th of September, and for all that we know, you may go on to 14th of September. <laughs> for the <time>. That's right. <laughs> so, th thanks for bearing with us. And Absolutely. We'll Thank you. And we now have the open session. Participants, please type in your comments or questions in the chat box, and those watching on Facebook can type uh, their comments in the comment box or their questions there. Uh, we have the Executive Director of Cook Islands Family Welfare Association, uh, Rongo file. Uh, and Rongo, what is your perspective on this issue? 
we are really curious to know. Hi, Kirana, everybody. I'm having a bit of difficulty with my video. Okay. Uh, you can hear me, but I would like to, to, to share um, in terms of the services that um, uh, Cook Islands Family Welfare provides. Um, we do continue with providing services to our elderly women um, to the age of 65. And when we're providing pap smear um, services, we do actually include the elder women, older women um, when they request for it. So nobody is actually denied that service. And uh, as well, we, when we provide the breast examination, um, we do include older women who actually feel the need that, you know, there is something wrong or they are sensing there is, um, they're having problems. Um, so that actually is accompanied with um, risk examination, um, self-examination, and then we actually, um, actually have the services of mammogram as well. But not so lucky with the COVID-19. Uh, we've been, uh, we haven't been able to actually ex um, access um, these services. Um, it, it's to do with the um, the tests that um, are required to be um, flown to New Zealand and Australia. So unfortunately for the women of the Cook Islands, um, there are quite a few services that are not, uh, that we're not able to access during this period, probably for the, for the whole year, for the year of 2020. Um, as well, um, we're able to deliver services. We have a doctor, a locum doctor that provides services to the elderly at two of the outreach sites that we have. Um, I would like to actually just have Polly, um, our program coordinator, perhaps to add to that briefly, very quickly. Thank you. Yes, Polly, welcome. Thank you. Um, let me just try if I could. Um, I'm not sure if my video is going to be working. Let me try that one. Um, Kirana, everyone, uh, I work from the Cook Islands, um, Cook Islands Family Welfare Association, and we are in the middle of the Pacific, the southern part of the Pacific. I think in terms of services for the elderly, we're a bit different, I think, because the society do still embrace uh, the elderly, um, older people. And at the same time, the society somehow, the older people have a bit more say. But in terms of, like, like the other presenters, in terms of knowledge of your uh, sexual health, of your personal health, it is a bit more different because um, it really depends on belief. But as Ron was mentioned, we've actually tried our best to integrate um, the sexual and reproductive health services, including the non-SRH medical, like NCD, when they come to our clinic or when we go to the community. Um, we, as I was sharing earlier on, one of our older clients actually was a 67-year-old male who wanted an STI test because he just had a new partner and he said, I'd like to start this with a clean health kind of thing. So we, are with, uh, that's an advantage, like, I guess, uh, culturally also an adva advantage in that context. But we also have now a, a lot of the women are now asking about menopause because after, uh, from 49, uh, by 50 years old, uh, some of them, we don't see them in the clinic unless they want to come for their pap smear or breast check. But I think that we have a, a group now asking for, um, talk about menopause. So that's a, some sort of a session that we're now developing to provide that uh, information education to this group of, uh, of our population. We also have prostate, but we haven't sort of uh, prostate checks, but not a regular one for the male, but more like part of our uh, outreach services that we do when we go to the community. So it's still like um, not a mainstream kind of service, but more of an, in de depends on the demand of the community that um, makes this request. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have the two questions on life cycle approaches. Uh, one question is from Maka, who is the executive director grassroots initiative for youth and elder elderly development organization in Tanzania. And I'm glad that the, this session, which is pertaining to perhaps problems from Asia Pacific region, has also attracted ma many uh, participants from other parts of the world. So Maka uh, wants to know that are we walking the talk on life cycle approach? 
will sharing experiences from communities, countries, and regions help in supporting the elderly for SRHR? Uh, would any of the speakers like to comment on this? Yeah, I can take this uh, question yes. because uh, I think the ICPD program of action and the Beijing platform for action as well talked about the life cycle approach uh, to address sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I think that is a very um, practical approach, basically, because you start with um, um, adolescence, then you uh, enter into um, uh, uh, the reproductive age, and then the continuum of care has not to stop at that, but it has to continue until, um, until uh, beyond basically uh, 60 years or 80 years uh, throughout the life cycle of a person. So life cycle approach is the way in which we will uh, approach uh, uh, healthcare well-being of people. But also the continuum of care is important in terms of uh, whether it is preventive care or uh, palliative care or uh, chronic uh, uh, disease treatment. So this has to be integrated in a manner and that's how we will have to equip our health systems. So um, definitely moving forward, uh, life cycle approach is something that should be part of our advocacy is what I would uh, totally recommend. And it should also be part of the universal health coverage that we are all working, uh, talking of, uh, about. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else would like to say on that? Uh, okay, we have a question from Dr. Zarina Begum, uh, a gynecologist from Pakistan. And she says, first of all, thank you for bringing up this bold topic, which is difficult to even talk about still in certain communities and countries. So she thanks all the panelists for really speaking on this topic. And again, her question is, how are we going to program life cycle approaches? Even medical communities are not very friendly when it comes to population aging. Uh, for instance, and I think this has been brought up in some of the presentations also, uh, we even stop cancer screening after a certain age and likewise for other diseases as if uh, it doesn't matter if the older people get those diseases. So we are not doing a good job in meeting needs of all girls and women of every age, be it ending violence or providing education or ensuring health care, reproductive health care for those in that age group. So what needs to be done more from say a medical point of view? And I think Dr. Soon had also brought that up in his uh, presentation in regarding in that study. Would anybody of the presenters like to address that? Uh, Sai, would you like to address it? Yeah, I think um, uh, the data and the trends in the region talk about um, a significant older person's demographic. And this is something all the member states, all the governments uh, need to acknowledge that, you know, that our countries, we do have a significant proportion of people who are uh, falling within the bracket of older persons. Now, having said that, uh, we also need to, um, like, you know, uh, uh, keep at the uh, back of our minds in terms of advocacy or whatever that we are doing that, um, uh, uh, you know, older persons um, are integral, basically, in order to, um, uh, you know, take forward. Um, uh, I mean, basically, what I think is the longevity revolution needs to be optimized. Uh, so when we are talking about older persons, we need to then say that, yes, we have uh, older persons with us. And how do we ensure that we provide, we ensure that uh, the life of older persons is full of quality, uh, dignity, human rights are ensured, gender equality is ensured. And once we uh, have that approach to, um, uh, to the work that we are doing, then I think we will be in a better uh, place in order to, um, you know, integrate older persons uh, uh, overall health and well-being in the national policies and programs and integrate a life cycle approach. Thank you. Uh, Krishna, would you like to share something? Because uh, Zarina talks about uh, stopping of cancer screening. You, you mentioned something uh, to that extent in the uh, case of prostate. Thank you. Thank you, Sovaji. And uh, I just wanted to make three points here about our friends who raised about life cycle health, uh, addressing the health issue, that's very, it's, it's the whole life, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's uh, healthy, it's education, it's training, it's the whole life cycle thing, it will go in the entire life of any human being uh, at all ages. 
And one thing I would like to highlight at this stage is we have been, you know, making uh, enough emphasis that uh, we don't have enough data, we don't have enough data. We'll never have enough data uh, because we always need more data for, for um, upgrading our policies and programs. But if I look back into the last 10 years, we have a lot of data that collected by many friends. So I think the time is to go on continuing and expanding, collecting more data uh, at, again, life cycle data collection and, and also using them in our education system. Uh, and the, mainly when we say life cycle approach, it is the added years. In in last uh, 70 years, we have added more than 40 years in our life, in life, the average life expectancy. But no country has it a complete plan uh, for how to use that added life for the national development or social upliftment. And those life cycle approach is very important. My friend who raised, who's, who raised this question, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, there was a question from Swapna Majumdar, a senior journalist from India. Unfortunately, she had to leave a little early and she thanks uh, you for the insights from the region and wants if you could share more details about the survey you referred from India. Uh, so can you please share the link of that survey uh, in the chat box for everyone? Yeah, I, um, I wrote back in there, but I wasn't sure if she was still on. If you send me her email address, I can. Also, my presentation has in the notes column, it has quite a few of the references, but it might not have all of them. So I can also just send, or when I send you the final version of the presentation, I can add in some of the surveys that I drew from, yeah. Okay. Could I say something on the previous point? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, so I think um, this might not be like a clinical laundry list, but I think about it from a public health perspective myself. So I think, you know, one question is, where do older men and women have contact with the health system? And I think, you know, part of that is annual checkups in some countries where there's a provision for that. And oftentimes we know our health systems um, need to be reoriented to address the kinds of health issues that people face in later life, including chronic diseases um, and care needs and disability and that sort of thing. Um, so we're working on that in general in a lot of countries. And you start to see, in addition to your national health strategy, you'll start seeing some countries with um, national healthy aging strategies or something that are trying to kind of top up or make sure that there's um, attention paid to some of these areas. I think those tend to leave out sexual health. So I, like I was saying in my presentation, there's two sides. One is what's being done in the age specific um, policy and strategy and program side and what's being done in the sexual and reproductive health policy and research and program side. So we heard examples in a previous conversation we had. Um, actually, Krishna shared that, you know, they had a big um, sexual health education campaign in Nepal. Uh, but when he asked, you know, why don't you speak to the older people, they just laughed at him. I talked to some of my colleagues who had worked in HIV with older people uh, and in this region as well as in Africa region. And they said, you know, you go to a four-day workshop and there's no discussion of uh, safe sex practices for the older people. The whole discussion is focused on caregiving for grandchildren, uh, maybe them educating younger generations on safe sex practices. Um, and, you know, I had a colleague share with me that in Mumbai there was a social worker who was doing one of these workshops and somebody came and said, could you bring condoms to the next meeting? And she kind of said, okay, I'll do that. And she brought them in the whole basket, you know, was taken by these seniors at a senior social center. And she asked them the next session, why is this that, you know, everybody is taking, needed this or is taking it. And they said, when we try to purchase them from shopkeepers, we get laughed at. So you have some societal things that need to change. But I do think that health systems can, like if you had primary health care doctors, and if you had the so sexual and reproductive health outreach and screening campaigns, age inclusive and mainstreaming older people into those. I think that that kind of legitimizes that it's okay and normal for older people to be having sex. And that starts to shift public perceptions as well. So I think there's kind of a two-sided street. So, you know, I, I saw 
one more thing on this is the World Health Organization is pushing for integrated care for older people in primary health care, and they have 10 domains. Um, urinary incontinence is kind of in the background paper, but doesn't come through. And otherwise, there's nothing on sexual health there either. So it's just one of these things that it's like, I think the leadership may actually be need to be joint, but I think the sexual and reproductive health sector has kind of a responsibility to step up and take leadership because a lot of the people involved in um, aging and health are not paying attention to this at all and have never paid attention to it. Uh, so they won't have the expertise that the others can bring. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. And we have- yeah. uh, Just add Kathleen yeah. here. Yes. Sorry, just okay. add me. Add Kathleen here is like, you know, I think the whole um, uh, paradigm, there needs to be a paradigm shift in how we see, um, you know, healthcare from disease prevention to affirmative sexuality around SRHR. I think that will be the framing and it will help, uh, you know, for older persons, but also across the life cycle approach. Thank you. Uh, we have many questions for Professor Son. Uh, and one question is from Manju Karmacharya that they, in China, still many women who have not removed, got their IUD removed even after menopause. Mm -hmm. In your analysis, what kind of gynecological problems are they suffering? And Professor Son, there is another similar question uh, from uh, Yashoda uh, from uh, MSF. Uh, and she says that IUD is inserted for 10 years duration or for longer. If so, follow-ups are not monitored accordingly or awareness not created. And have you come across any cases of endometrial cancer in those who could, did not get their IUD removed? Okay, that's a good question. So I actually, uh, I'm focusing on the quality, uh, the service quality of family planning program in China. So uh, uh, theoretically, so the woman who had the IUD uh, insertion uh, when they were young, so uh, uh, when they reached the menopause uh, period, the quality service, uh, the rural, the local family uh, uh, station or, or the maternal child health hospital should have IUD removal for them so when they, uh, during their uh, menopause period. But actually the service is, is, is very poor there. So almost 20% of them have not had IUD removal because the local family uh, uh, commission and the local family station, they're focusing on the, the young people after one child family, uh, after one child delivery, they, ha they suggest them to have, to have IUD insertion. So that IUD insertion becomes their major task rather than the removal for the, the middle-aged woman. So we find that it's really the problem uh, because the, you know, because that the, China, uh, the China's fan plan program, when they initiate this pro program, is a, is a you know, decreased fertility oriented. You know, try to uh, put the, uh, try to let the fertility rate is going down. So they focus on the prevent unwanted pregnancy rather than the, you know, the health issues. So right now we, make the, we try to uh, use this data to, to, to give the National Fan Plan Association uh, let them understand that uh, is uh, uh, IUD removal also is the big task. It's their responsibility to uh, to do in the future. So and and because of the aging issues, the aging population become bigger, particularly in the rural area. You know, the rural area, most of the young people they move to the to the city, and they work there, and live there, and they never been back again. So the rural the public aging issues in China is is really uh, the problem in rural area. The most uh, the, um, uh, the rural area, the families, they, they are the middle-aged people and the elderly people. And the, you know, the older people, the most of the, the oldest people are women. So uh, we find, so it's a two sides issues. So one is the women that did not recognize this is a, a problem. This is the, the, the issue that should go to the hospital or the family clinic to have an ID removal. And, and from the prevention side, so they should tell them. So the time you should have the ID removal, uh, whatever you have the side effects or not, because most most of most of them they don't feel it's the problem. It's good. It's okay. It's no problem. They just they don't want to make 
to do the operation. So they, they worried about for that. They, uh, some people uh, removed the IUD because of the, the, the poor quality services. They feel a painful or something, then tell the story to another one. So the, 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 the devil said, oh, the, oh, I don't want to go because of some problems. So that is the issue. But uh, some, uh, we, in our study, I, because the, uh, the time limited, I did not show the detail to you, but we find that almost uh, one third of them uh, got to the uh, vaginitists and the cervicists. It's that uh, the, uh, the uh, reproductive tract infection, the, the rate, infection rate is higher among the, uh, the women who had IUD insertion rather than who use the, uh, the pills or use the uh, or use sterilization or a condom and others. But not a big problem. So, but the only thing that, uh, because it's not free, if you're after 50 years old, and it's, we find the gap is really the, the top design problem. When the gap, uh, the, you know, the family planning program is free for the, a, the age between 15 to 49 for the married couples only. But the, the rural medical insurance system is also a good system, but not that system not cover the contraceptive services. So that means that the cut if the people beyond 50 years old, so they must pay by themselves. No medical insurance or family planning services is uh, uh, the free service for them. So that is, we find that a big problem. Then uh, we calculate that it's about 200, uh, two, uh, 2,600, 2,600, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Okay, uh, sorry, it's a 26 million female population for the next 10 years. So uh, there are in the many post period in China, in the rural area, only in rural area. So most, half of them, they, 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 uh, they had IUD session. So they need IUD over services. So to the, let them, let them understand this is really the, the, oh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear. Okay, so this is a big, so, so fortunately, so right now the central government and the National Family Plan Association, they recognize this is a, a really the, the, the problem in neglected before. So they are, uh, we are going to uh, to make a, a plan for uh, the Chinese five-year plan to cover these services for the women aged 50 to 64 for the next five years. So I'm, uh, I, I'm leading, I'm, I'm a, a, a principal investigator to leading an ex, ex, expert group to uh, follow up this action and, uh, and also including the educational uh, program and also uh, clinic services for them. Okay. Thank you very much. I have switched off my video because I have a poor internet connection. We are running short. We have short ahead of the time, but we have a few questions for Dr. Tenai Peng. And one question is from Kathleen herself, uh, who says excellent research. But could you, is there any, could you comment on the difference between Tamil and Chinese respondents uh, on, the, on the questions uh, of your study? Uh, both are non-Malay, but their cultures are different. So did you find any difference there? Okay, Doc thank you for, yes. thank you for the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, the Malays were mm -hmm. much more uh, likely to be engaged in all the intimate acts. But for the Chinese and Indians, uh, in terms of the, uh, some of the intimacy acts, they were quite similar. For example, holding hand, both about 67% uh, for the uh, Chinese and the Tamil, uh, hugging about 54% for both, and uh, kissing about 45% for both, communication uh, about 93-94% for both, but there are some differences with respect to uh, sharing dates, for example, the Chinese 73.3%, uh, the Tamil 64.5%, so there were some uh, pronounced differences here, and in terms of uh, 
having sex. Uh, Chinese, uh, we have uh, 43.1%. The Tamil, only about 29%. So the Tamil were the least of the sexy type uh, among the three ethnic groups here. Only 29% reported having sex compared to 43%. Okay. That, that, those are the ethnic differences that we can, we can uncover. Is that, is that enough? Yes, yes, that's, thank you. One more question for you, doctor, from uh, Jonathan David Flavius. And Jonathan wants to know that with more than 50% of older Malaysian men still sexually active, is no scalpel vasectomy a practical op uh, option? Are there religious constraints to surgical contraception methods for men? I'm sure they are. Uh, because uh, in this country, uh, uh, sterilization are mostly done on the women. Like almost 90 over percent of the sterilization. <laughs> Even in the case of uh, Indonesia, the same thing. Uh, uh, I think in terms of the Muslim community, uh, the male methods are not that popular, even condom as well. Okay. Most of the times, the women who take up the burden uh, in terms of use of contraceptive methods, male participation is quite minimal okay. in terms of uh, terminal method as well as uh, use of condom. It's not very popular uh, in Malaysia and also in the case of Indonesia. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's the same in other countries also, at least of the Asia Pacific region. It's the, the onus falls on the women only. Yes. And you're very right in mentioning that. We have overshot the time, but one last take home message uh, I want from all the panelists. And that, that was a question from uh, Kalpana Acharya, very senior journalist from Nepal also, what? that what can the older persons do to improve their lot? And what, how can we collectively a sort of bust these myths around ageism. And sometimes it is said that older persons to some extent are responsible for their own plight. So what can they do along with the others, along with policymakers to bring about a change? A quick take home message from all our panelists before we end. Yes, Sono would we like to start? Yeah, I, I think, um, again, uh, we all need to have more evidence uh, when we do advocacy for policy. So I, I definitely think that the older people can also, you know, use their political power, you use their uh, ability to influence people. They have very vast networks, obviously, and life experiences to share. I also want to talk about intergenerational collaboration. So young people and old people working together on, on this kind of advocacy would be great. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, Kathleen, please. Yeah, I think there's many things that older people can do, but one thing I think they could do is um, to be speaking more openly within within their whatever their cultural norms and stuff allows them to do but like with their friends with their doctors i i think sometimes people need to start holding their health providers accountable so coming in and initiating the conversation rather than waiting to see if the doctor may or may not bring it up um, so i think it's a question of information as krishna i'm sure will say on his point and then acting on that, sharing it with others, um, being a being inquisitive. I think that's difficult if you if you don't have access to information. Thank you, Sai. Maybe have your views. Yeah, I would go back to the previous uh, statement that I made in terms of like you know the shift uh, from uh, a disease prevention to um, to uh, affirmative sexuality, and I think um, that is um, uh, very key for us to move forward. But also uh, cross movement linkages, like you know, uh, older persons need to work with other civil society, other movement groups. Uh, to ensure um, that um, their issues are being brought up um, uh, as a whole. So that's my thank you. Take care. Krishna ji. Oh, thank you, Sovaji, and, and thank you for the for this opportunity to uh, to put the very blanket questions, cover everything, how to <laughs> what older people can do. I think in in this uh, present age, 
uh, you know, you must advertise yourself. You must say something. Even if you go to doctor, if you don't say what health problem you have, a doctor cannot treat you. The society is not against older people. So I think older people need to speak out. And today's speak out means you, you should have your own radio, uh, radio program. You should have your own journals. You should have your own uh, daily newspapers. Uh, you should have your, you know, first the education, then the, the, the media. Use the media, come out from media. And reach to as many people as possible. Old people and the society is not against older people. People seems to be not doing enough for the older people because we are not telling them what are the situation we are facing. And for us in this new population structure, for us, even for us, I, I'm an old person, so I, I can say us, uh, I'm 67. So uh, for us, even life is new in the society. So we are also learning and we must learn and you must say, you we must provide, uh, you, you must use the media to put your voice. I think media is a very effective way of communicating across the, the population so that we are all integrated and seen as one society of one concern. Thank you. Thank you. I don't agree with you on one count. You said I'm an older person. I'm an old person. So I don't agree with you there. <laughs> you, you, are, you look to be one of the youngest. So you have to take back that. <laughs> Uh, I can argue on it, but uh, I will not. Because no. we are you, are not, you are not old. That is my take. <laughs> no, I claim that I am old. Okay. Well, I don't want to be young anymore. First, I, I have been young enough. And yes. that's how now I'm graduated to be old person, senior citizen. Thank you. <laughs> because I have come across 80 years young people and 30 years old people. So that's in the yes. mind. Yes. 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 Yes, thank you. Thank you. So with this, we come to the close of the seventh session of APCR, SSRP and virtual. And my sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speakers, abstract presenters, and to the participants. I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPF for their support and help to uh, hold these APCR, SSRP and virtual sessions. We will now meet on Monday, September 28th at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the eighth virtual session on the theme of safe abortion and SRHR in Asia Pacific. Bye for now. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Soloji, Sovaji, Bobby G, and Kathleen. Kathleen, uh, it's so nice to see you. And Saiji, and everybody who is here. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.